So this is lecture six, where we're going to look at sampling and discrete time signals. So we're already halfway through. Well, we're just, we're just over halfway through our set of 11 lectures. And this is the last lecture where we're going to talk about signals. So from next week, we'll be talking about systems. So the remaining five lectures are all about systems. So today we're going to talk about sampling and discrete time signals. So it's the transition between continuous time and discrete time. So just as a reminder of where we are in the schedule, this is week six. So we started the week with a test. That was class test three. Our next test is in two weeks' time on the 30th of November. So save that in your diaries. So the next class test will cover lectures six and seven. So it'll be half about signals and half about systems. So it'll be a slightly odd test because the two topics are not linked. But as I said earlier, starting from, from this test onwards, you'll find that they're easier. So the test you just completed, that was the hardest test. So just a quick reminder of what we completed last week. So we finished talking about the Fourier transform and the properties of the Fourier transform. And you've seen through the problem sheets and through the test how these properties make fairly complicated um, questions really easy. So Parseval's theorem allows us to find energy in the frequency domain instead of the time domain. The um, sifting property of the uh, Dirac delta function, although it's not a Fourier transform property, also enables us to simplify integrations. And the duality property means that we don't need to always calculate the Fourier transform of something if we know um, that it's part of a Fourier pair. The convolution theorem made it easier for us to avoid carrying out a convolution. We can simply carry out multiplications instead. Now this week, we're not going to talk about frequency domain representations. Oh, we will, we will a little, but we will be talking about the transition between continuous time to discrete time. And that transition is called sampling. So we'll be talking about the Nyquist theorem for sampling. We'll be talking about how discrete time signals are represented. And we'll talk about signal recovery or reconstruction, which is the opposite of sampling. So a sampled signal needs this process to be recovered, to return back to its continuous time uh, original format. There'll be a problem class on Monday, and there'll be a new problem sheet with solutions. Next week, as I said, we're going to be talking about systems. Now, just to illustrate what we've been looking at. So remember in week three, we spoke about periodic signals. We spoke about periodic signals that were continuous in time. So signals that looked like this. Remember, these are continuous signals. That are, periodic, that are periodic, so continuous in time and periodic. And for that, we used the Fourier series. Then, in lecture four, we looked at non-periodic signals, so signals that might have looked like this. So these signals are non-periodic, for which the Fourier series would be inappropriate. So for these, we used the Fourier transform. But we said the Fourier transform is also applicable to periodic signals. So Fourier transform works for both, Fourier series only for 
periodic signals. What we didn't mention was the discrete time variance. So if we have a periodic signal that's discrete, so if I have a signal that looks like this, If that's a periodic signal, how do I find the spectrum of that? Or if I have a, um, a, a non-periodic signal that's also discrete, so a decaying function, a decaying exponential, that's um, discrete. What does the spectrum of that look like? Well, for these, there are equivalents of the Fourier series and Fourier transform called the discrete time Fourier series and the discrete time Fourier transform. So the discrete time Fourier series and the discrete time Fourier transform. And often you will find this referenced as FFT, fast Fourier transform. Now, I've cut this out of ELEC270. So ELEC270 does not contain these discrete time variants. So you might find them in textbooks, you might come across them um, when reading about uh, signals and systems, but I have managed to uh, uh, compress the curriculum by re removing two weeks worth of effort to allow us to spend that time uh, in solving problems to a greater depth. Okay, so the reason there's only 11 lectures is because I've removed some of the content so that we can study um, the content that we are covering in greater depth. Okay, so just be aware that there is a discrete time version of the two things that we've covered in lectures three and four. Now, this transition from analog to digital, that really is what is behind our transition or our interest in uh, continuous, continuous to discrete time. Not because these are the same. No, they're not the same. But in order to get to pure digital, we need a discrete time uh, signal. So uh, the first step in digitization is sampling. Let me write that down. So the first step in digitization is sampling. And we'll talk about sampling in a minute. But before that, let's say a few words about digital data. So, do you have any of these lying around at home? Audio cassettes. Do you or your parents have any um, vinyl records at home? Even DVDs, which are digital, are becoming obsolete. So, this transition between analog and digital, anyone who's used analog media can appreciate some of the benefits or the advantages of digital media. So if you just think, what advantage does digital media give you over um, analog media? There are some obvious advantages and some less obvious advantages. So everything, almost everything we do on the internet, everything we do on our computers, so computers, so computers, internet, cloud, storage, apps on your smartphone, all of these use digital media, digital content and digital communications. So what advantage does digital give you over analog? It gives you the, the possibility to correct errors, it gives you a higher capacity with digital channels, the ability to compress your data, to encrypt your data, to store your data digitally without um, uh, corruption, and importantly, networking. So w w without, without the ability to network, you wouldn't be able to consume the media on your, on your phones. 
because the media lives on some hard drive somewhere and for you to, to download this, this, these hard drives live in server facilities. These server facilities um, constitute the cloud and it's the cloud that will make available to you this content. So going digital um, actually makes possible almost everything that we take for granted today. So that's why sampling is important. Okay, so all of this is, if you like, is an introduction to what I'm about to say. So here goes. Remember I said sampling is the first step of digitization? Well, the second step is quantization. I'll explain that in a second. So um, we're talking about digitization and today we're talking about sampling, okay? We won't be talking about quantization. You will be looking at both of these later. You'll be looking at quantization next semester in ELEC 202, and you'll look, be looking at sampling in ELEC 207, and again in ELEC 202. So you'll be you probably even be doing um, quantization in ELEC 202. So you'll cover these things um, uh, multiple times. And it might be that we use different notations each time, but that's fine. So the first step we said is sampling. And that means taking a continuous analog signal and converting it to a discrete time analog signal. And together, we call this analog to digital conversion, or ADC. And very importantly, if this is done correctly, and by correctly, um, I mean if we follow one particular rule, then this is a reversible process. That means we can take the uh, digital signal and recover the original analog signal perfectly, without any losses. Okay, so that, what we mean by a reversible process, it means we can recover the original signal without losses. So if you just imagine our original signal is this continuous time analog signal, our sampled signal is discrete in time, but it's still analog. After we discretize the amplitude, it now becomes digital. It now becomes discrete in amplitude, and it's also discrete as it happens in time. Okay, so here we have continuous, let me write that out, continuous amplitude. So it's equal to analog. And here we have discrete amplitude, and that is digital. And just to be really clear about this, I'm not talking about the um, curve. I'm talking about these samples. So these samples are th what I'm describing as being continuous in amplitude. And it's the same samples here after quantization that I'm considering to be discrete in amplitude. But we will not be talking about quantization in this module beyond this. I just want you to understand where quantization lies in the process of digitization. We will be talking about sampling. So what do we mean by sampling? As I keep saying, it's the process of converting a signal from continuous to discrete. And by continuous, I mean continuous time, and discrete, I mean discrete time. So a signal x of t is continuous in time. A signal x of n is discrete time. You're familiar with this, and you're familiar with this. It's the interim 
x of n times t, where t is your sampling period, so t, uppercase t, it's not what you um, uh, previously used the notation t for period, for a periodic signal, although you could say it's the period of the clock. So the clock here has a period, and that period is t. So this period here is t. It's the interval between adjacent samples. So you can imagine that if we have a switch that's switching on, off, on, off, on, off, fs times a second, where fs is a sample rate, then that will give us a discrete time version of our original signal. Are they the same? No, they're not the same. This is continuous time, this is discrete time, they're not equal. One is called x of t, one is called x of n. And n is a discrete variable. So n is an integer. Because it's a discrete time variable. So again, this transition between x of n and x of t. So you can imagine that that switch, the switch we just described, is powered by an impulse train. So x of t would be your input, x of n would be your output, and your impulse train would drive the switch. And this time between adjacent samples, that's what we're calling t, which is the reciprocal of the sampling rate. So this is just how we would represent it. So x of n, if we have a causal signal that only exists with positive values of n, then it will be a set of discrete samples. So n isn't time, it's an index, or indicating time step. So 2, 1, 0, that's your index. So this is for a causal signal, where n is 0 or greater than 0, but it's possible to have signals which are non-causal and would therefore have negative values of n. So that's a, how signals look um, mathematically in one dimension. If you have two-dimensional signals, remember we keep saying that a two-dimensional signal is an image. We're not covering image processing in this module, but you may want to consider ELEC 319 next year, which is an image processing module. So ELEC 319 is image processing. So these two-dimensional signals, which we call images, consist of these little picture elements. These picture elements we call pixels. Okay, and these pixels, um, the number of pixels we have in an image determines something we call the resolution of the image. And if you consider this to be um, an image, sorry, a signal, then, so for example, this in origin, wasn't digital. In origin, this was a little girl, and this was a Playboy model. So something had to happen in order for these two people to be represented as digital images. So in the case of this Playboy model, her picture was um, published in a, uh, in a paper format, in a magazine. So that was analog. Someone then had to digitize that, so it went into a scanner and it was digitized. And the resolution of the scanner is what we would refer to in this module as the sample rate. So 1 over 
NFT. In the same way, if you have a digital camera, you can talk about your resolution, or how many megapixels, what you're actually describing is the sample rate. Okay, that's just a bit of context. You don't need to worry about that. This isn't covered in this module. So, transformations. We've looked at transformations for analog signals. We dabbled a little bit with discrete transformations. Now I'll just mention it formally, that if you multiply the independent variable n by a negative one, that gives you a reflection. If you multiply it by a constant, you get a compression. If you add or subtract something, that gives you a shift to the left or the right. If you multiply the signal, that will give you a magnification or a reduction, depending on whether A is positive or negative. And if you add or subtract A, then that will give you a, a translation or a shift upwards or downwards. So this is basically the same as with continuous time. So a little bit more about notation. The discrete time version of an impulse or a delta function, we've already used this before, but instead of having an arrow, we now typically represent it with a dot. Okay, so because it's discrete time, it only exists at certain instances in time. It doesn't exist in between. So it's zero in between these uh, values. So we have a unit step, u of n, we have uh, delta n, and we have a unit ramp. So unit step would start from one, etc. So nothing new here. So we're still talking about the transition from continuous to discrete. So we call this process sampling, so a sampler. In this case, instead of the square brackets, I'm showing you that some books continue to use um, normal parentheses instead of the square brackets, um, and their time index is discrete. Okay, in this module, we will strictly observe the notation where we have square brackets. Okay, so whenever you see brackets like that, in this module, you assume it's continuous time. Whenever there's square brackets, assume it's discrete time. OK, this is just a little bit more about notation. The important part of this lecture, so there are really only two things, two important things in this module, or in this lecture. This is the first of the two. We said that converting a signal from continuous Continuous time to discrete time is called sampling. And we said this process, if we do it correctly, is a reversible process. So what, what do we mean by doing it correctly? So it means that the samples shouldn't be too far apart, basically. So how far apart can the samples be? It's the time between samples that is critical, that makes the sampling process reversible or not reversible. So the question is, how far can these samples be? The answer, says um, Nyquist, it's actually um, these two people together, Nyquist and Shannon, they say, or the Nyquist sampling theorem says, that the sampling rate must be at least twice, at least twice, so fs must be at least twice the highest frequency in the signal. Frequency, sampling rate fs must be at least twice the maximum frequency in the signal. Okay? Now, even this equal bit, I'm going to remove that and say it needs to be greater than twice the uh, bandwidth of the signal. But the Nyquist sampling rate says at least, so it can be 
twice the highest frequency component. That means that that frequency component will be lost. So in practice, you always need to sample at a rate greater than the Nyquist rate. So the Nyquist rate, the Nyquist rate is that rate. It's twice the highest frequency component available in the signal. If you sample at that rate or greater than that rate, you can recover your signal. If your samples are too far apart, that means Fs is less than the Nyquist rate, then you cannot recover your signal. If your samples are too close, then that's no problem. It means you're going to have a lot of data. You're collecting more samples than you need. It's wasteful. It's not efficient. But it isn't a problem in terms of recovery. Now, when we say a signal has a, an upper limit or a highest frequency component of Fb, what do we mean? We're describing something called a band-limited signal. A band-limited signal is a signal with a limited bandwidth. Okay, so we understand what the concept of bandwidth is. Remember we spoke about the Fourier transform and the frequency axis. So a signal can have a bandwidth, but that bandwidth can either be limited, can either have a, a, a maximum value, or it can be unlimited. Now that is not band limited. Okay, so this is a band limited signal. This is not a band limited spectrum, spectrum or signal. So for the first signal, for a band limited signal, the Nyquist rate will be twice that. So whatever this is, let's call it omega naught. So the Nyquist rate will be twice that. So the sampling rate, or let's call it Fn, will be twice omega naught over 2 pi. So I can sample this, and that's no problem. The problem with an unlimit a band unlimited signal, or a, a signal that is not band limited, is that I can't do that because it has an infinite bandwidth. So what do I do to convert a band unlimited signal to a band limited signal? Well, I can do two things. I can either pass it through a low pass filter. A low pass filter will chop off some of the signal. Because it's a low pass filter, it will filter out the high frequencies. So I could do that. I could just pass my signal through a low pass filter. But the question is, you know, what frequency do I set my low-pass filter? You want to contain enough of the energy for the recovered signal to still resemble the or original signal. So what we use is the 99% containment bandwidth, or the equivalent bandwidth. Sometimes we use 99%, sometimes we use 95%. And we use that to approximate Fb. So we say, okay, it's we don't know what the bandwidth is, but we can approximate it to um, the 99% containment bandwidth. And then we can apply a low-pass filter, and then we can sample it. So we've come, we've, we've come across this before. We looked at it uh, last week. So we're talking about the bandwidth that contains most of the energy. So if we're talking about 99%, then it's 99% of the energy of the signal. So for this signal, the energy of the signal, using Parseval's theorem, is 1 over 2 pi, the integral of the spectrum squared, or the Fourier transform squared. So that's the energy of the signal. 99% of that is 0.99 times that. 
So here, this numerator, if you look carefully, they're almost identical. The only difference between the numerator and the denominator is in the denominator, I'm integrating over all the frequency axes. That's from minus infinity all the way to infinity. And in the numerator, I'm only integrating from minus omega to omega. So I'm only integrating over this bit. Okay, so the graph is a bit exaggerated, just to make that visible. In practice, 99% of the energy wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be so visible here. And again, I'm talking about 99% of the energy, not 99% of the frequency. You can't find 99% of infinity. But you can, you can find a number for that, and you can find an expression for that, and you can mathematically rearrange those to find omega. Why do we need to find omega? Because if we're sampling, we need to know, if we're sampling, we need to know fs. I can't find Fs without finding Fn. Because Fs needs to be greater than or equal to the nichrostrate. And Fn equals 2 times omega over 2 pi. Why do I keep dividing by 2 pi? I keep dividing by 2 pi because I want it in hertz, because when I say f, I'm talking about frequency in hertz, whereas omega is in radians per second, so I divide by 2 pi. So why am I finding omega? To find fn. Why am I finding fn? To find fs, the sampling rate. Why do I want the sampling rate? Because I'm trying to digitize, and sampling is the first step in digitization. And we've looked at this before, and I've presented um, this in the form of a couple. So this example is fairly detailed. It goes into the Fourier transform, maybe unnecessary at this stage. Another example, similar kind of signal, double-sided. Again, the key here is to look at how once we have an expression that involves omega, we can then use that to find the bandwidth. Or we can, we can use that to find the containment bandwidth. Once we know the total energy, and we know the proportion that we want, 99%, we can then use solve to find omega. Okay, this is an important um, question. When you have more than one signal, so let's say you had two signals, x1 and x2. If I were to add these signals together, how would the spectrum look? So if I were to take this spectrum and this spectrum, if I were to add the signals in the time domain, we know using the scaling property that that al allows me to add the spectra. So addition in time is equal to addition in frequency. We know that. So the question is, what would the bandwidth be? Why am I interested in the bandwidth? Because I'm interested in the Nyquist rate. Why am I interested in the Nyquist rate? Because I want my sampling to be reversible. And why am I interested in sampling? Because it's the first step in digitization. So that's why we're interested in the Nyquist rate of the sum of two signals. So if I add in the time domain, it means I can add in the frequency domain. What do you think will happen if I were to add a spectrum with a bandwidth omega 1 with another signal with a spectrum bandwidth omega 2? Well, you can just imagine adding these two together, it wouldn't have this bandwidth, it would have this bandwidth, omega 1. Why? Because omega 1 is bigger than omega 2. 
So what we're going to do is I'll give you a few heuristics. These heuristics or rules of thumb generally hold. They're sort of common sense shortcuts to help you or to save time. So when we add two signals, the resulting bandwidth is the larger of the two. So when we say max, that means the larger of the two. So whichever is bigger, omega 1 or omega 2. Max omega 1 means the larger of the two. So in this case, it would be omega 1. So let me write it here, equals omega 1 in this case. When you multiply two signals, so let's say I ought to multiply this signal by that signal. If you multiply in the time domain, that corresponds to a convolution in the frequency domain. So that convolution in the frequency domain means that these will end up adding up because you're going to slide one across the other and you end up spreading the spectrum out and you end up with a spectrum twice as large. And you can carry out the integral on some example signals and come to the same conclusion. So when you multiply two signals, you convolve in frequency and that convolution means you have a spectrum with a bandwidth not equal to omega 1, not equal to omega 2, but equal to the sum of omega 1 plus omega 2. Now the opposite is also true. When you convolve in the time domain, that's the equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain. And if I were to multiply this spectrum by this spectrum, because omega 1 is bigger than omega 2, then for all this part of the frequency axis, greater than omega 2, you have 0 multiplied by something. So 0 multiplied by something non-zero gives you 0. So you end up with a bandwidth of omega 2, which is the smaller of the two. So that's the smaller of the two. Okay, so these are handy tricks. When you add or subtract signals, the bandwidth of the sum or the difference will be the larger of the two. When you multiply, then you take the sum, and when you convolve, you take the smaller of the two. Okay, a few more things we need to cover. One is oversampling and aliasing. And the other is reconstruction. So first of all, oversampling. Oversampling isn't a big problem, but it's what happens if you take more samples than you need. So if your sampling rate, Fs, is bigger than the Nyquist rate. So Fs is too large, okay? We call that oversampling. And you have more samples than you need. Another problem is called aliasing, and that arises when Fs is too small. And this is called undersampling. So undersampling is when Fs is less than Fn. Oversampling is where you have Fs greater than Fn. Now, if you look at this second example, our signal is undersampled, meaning we have samples which are too far apart, meaning that the time between these samples is too big. So t is greater than 1 over 2 fb. Or maybe in the, more relevant to this example, it's one, one over Fn. So 
it's too big, the time is too big. It means the sample rate is too small. So what happens is when we try to reconstruct the signal, we construct a low frequency signal that passes through all those samples. And that's not what our original signal looked like. Our original signal was this signal here. That's my signal. But because I've undersampled the signal, when trying to reconstruct it, I'll reconstruct that, which is a, a distortion. So that distortion we call aliasing. It's also called spectral folding. And it isn't immediately clear why it's called spectral folding. I'll clarify that in a bit. There's a nice little um, demonstration. I, I recommend you have a look at that. Um, it's a little Java uh, applet. Um, and it, it, it shows you how changing the frequency and changing the sampling frequency will give you a distorted, reconstructed signal. So let me show you that. So here you have an example. So in blue, I can't use my, um, my, my, my pen on the screen, but if you look at the blue signal, that's my original signal my continuous time signal. And the, in red, these are my samples, and I'm going to increase the sampling rate, see? That's a seriously oversampled signal, because I've got more than two samples per cycle. So that's, if you look at the bottom sketch, you can see the blue line on the left, the blue spectral line, that's like a Fourier transform. That's showing the frequency of my original sine wave. And the vertical line on the right, that's red spike on the right, at 45, that's the Fourier transform of um, the uh, sampling clock. So look what happens as the sampling rate reduces. Actually, I'm going to increase the sample of the, the, the rate of my, the sample rate of, sorry, increase the frequency of my blue signal. I'm going to increase it. So now you can, if you look at the numbers, it's around seven. And the sampling frequency, I'm going to bring it down to around 15. So now, what's happening there? So that's exactly seven and a half. What's happening at seven and a half? I'm sampling exactly at the Nyquist rate, exactly at seven and a half. So that means that I'm sampling exactly when the sine wave happens to be zero. So what kind of a reconstruction will I get if all my samples are zero? Obviously, I'm going to get a bunch of zeros. Now, I'm going to start increasing my signal slightly so that the signal is greater than 7.5. I'm sampling at 15, but my signal is going to go up to 8, 9, 10, 11. And look at the dotted line. The dashed line represented the re represents the reconstruction. So as I increase the rate of my signal, look at the reconstruction. The reconstruction looks nothing like my signal. It's a much lower frequency. That error, that distortion, that's aliasing. That's why we don't uh, undersample. Because when you try to reconstruct an undersample signal, you will get a distorted reconstruction. So you can play around with this um, yourselves and uh, get a feel uh, to how this works. Also, if you look at the um, bottom left of the page, you'll see Harry Nyquist and Claude Shannon, um, who uh, together are credited with the, uh, the sampling theorem. And you can read a little bit about their lives. Okay, so we've almost finished a few more things to go. Remember I said it was called um, spectral folding when we have aliasing. And this is um, a little illustration of how it works. So this is what we're familiar with in the time domain. This is what I haven't yet introduced to you, which is the frequency domain equivalence. So 
my original continuous time signal will have a spectrum. If it's band limited, then that's my, um, my bandwidth. So that's what we would previously be calling uppercase omega. Now it's just lowercase omega m. This is my sampling clock. That's my sampling signal. And it's, this is called a comb function. A comb function is just an infinite series of impulses. And the spectrum of a comb function happens to also be a comb function. It happens to also be an infinite series of impulses. And it's called a comb function because that's, that's what a comb looks like. A comb just looks like a... It looks like that, basically. So, that is at omega s, but it's also at um, multiples of omega s. Now, when we multiply in the time domain, the equivalent operation in the frequency domain is convolution because of the convolution property or the convolution theorem. So multiplying in the time domain will give you this discrete time signal. So we multiply these and the zeros give you zeros. So you end up with a discrete time signal. So this is sampling as we know it. If you take this spectrum and you convolve it with an infinite series of impulses, you end up with a spectrum that repeats itself. And it keeps repeating itself at multiples of fs. So it's at omega s, at 2 omega s, at 3 omega s, etc. What do we call a signal that repeats itself? We call a signal that repeats itself periodic. So we call the spectrum periodic. It's strange because periodic usually applies to time, but because we have an infinite number of identical replicas that repeat every omega uh, s radians per second or every fs hertz, we call such a spectrum periodic. So the useful um, com um, conclusion from this is that the spectrum of a discrete time signal is periodic. I'll write that down. The spectrum of a discrete time signal is periodic. That's nice because we previously said the spectrum of a periodic signal remember periodic signals from lecture three, is discrete. So the spectrum of a periodic signal is discrete, that's a Fourier series. The opposite, the spectrum of a discrete time signal, is periodic. So, again, we spoke about over and under sampling and I briefly mentioned critical sampling, this is what it looks like in the frequency domain. So critical sampling, that's when you're sampling at the Nyquist rate. You should avoid that if you can, but sometimes it's not a problem, particularly if the signal, even though it's band limited, it doesn't have energy at, or it doesn't have um, considerable, noticeable, significant energy at, um, omega b. So that's critical sampling where you have omega s minus omega s and again this repeats even though I've only shown one it repeats at multiples of omega s. So this is my original spectrum, but these are identical replicas. Okay, 
if I were to increase the sample rate, so if omega s were to increase, then clearly this spacing would increase. That's what we call oversampling, where um, omega s is greater than omega n, or f s greater than f n. The opposite is also true. If I undersample, if I were to reduce omega s, and just to make it really clear, this is what I mean by omega b, or the bandwidth, or omega m, let's call it, max. If you were to undersample, then you would have this here, and that's why we call it spectral folding, because we have a corruption of the spectrum here. We have an overlap of adjacent spectra. So it's not possible to recover the original signal. So we've lost part of the signal because of that overlap. So oversampling, a little bit of oversampling is good because it enables us to recover the original message perfectly. Critical sampling, it's difficult, you need a perfect filter to recover the original message, and even then, you would lose the component at omega m. Undersampling is definitely undesirable because it leads to this process called aliasing. And aliasing is spectral folding. Okay, another brief YouTube for you. Um, the sampling frequency must be at least twice the highest frequency contained in the signal to avoid aliasing. The Nyquist criterion guarantees that there are enough sample points to properly reconstruct the signal, provided the signal is a sine wave. Clearly, if the signal is composite and contains several frequency components, the sampling frequency must be at least twice the highest frequency component. An ideal square wave is an example of such a signal. It contains infinite frequencies, theoretically making it impossible to properly digitize. Aliasing could happen in movies, in a situation called wagon wheel effect. This is the effect when moving wheel seems to stand still or the propeller of an airplane appears slow. It could also happen in digital texts and pictures, causing them to look blurry. Aliasing happens in acoustic too. It translates to poor sound quality and static. It translates to poor sound quality and static. An oscilloscope can be used to illustrate the effect of aliasing on a signal. Consider a 10 MHz sine wave. When the time base of the oscilloscope is properly set, the oscilloscope sampling rate is sufficiently high to prevent aliasing, and the signal appears normal. However, at bigger time scales, the oscilloscope sampling rate is lowered and the Nyquist criterion is no longer met. This causes aliasing, making the frequency and the shape of the signal dramatically different. A sampling frequency equal to the signal frequency results in a solid line. Notice that since the two frequencies cannot be made exactly the same, the line is not stable. To prevent oscilloscope aliasing, either an anti-aliasing filter must be used, or the oscilloscope must be able to sample the signal according to the Nyquist theorem. Okay, so in that robotic voice, you had a, a little visual illustration of some of the effects of uh, aliasing. So, in the final few slides, I just want to... Um, talk about how we're going to recover our original signal. Okay, so just a reminder where we are. We are talking about signals which are now discrete in time and therefore periodic in frequency. And when we spoke about signals which were discrete in frequency, they would be periodic in time. So this was where the Fourier series applied. And this is where sampling has happened. 
Okay, so reconstruction is going back. It's recovering this signal from that, or recovering this signal from that. So even though what we want is to do that, this is what we want, what we often need to do mathematically is that. Even though it's, we're doing the same thing, we're recovering the original message. But thinking about this process in the frequency domain turns out to be easier than doing it in the time domain. So this is the question, the question for you. How can we recover the original signal from the sample signal? How do we do this? Well, we're going to need a filter. And the question for you is what kind of filter do we need? What kind of filter will take this spectrum and give me this spectrum? Just think about that for a second. What kind of filter will give me this from this? So in a normal lecture where we were meeting face to face, that would be a question where you would each have to answer and um, we can discuss the results. But if you want to block these high frequency components and pass the low frequency component, the kind of filter you need is a low pass filter. So what we need is a low pass filter. The low pass filter will block the high frequency uh, replicas and will keep only our original spectrum. So reconstruction equals low pass filter. in the frequency domain, obviously. So ideal reconstruction, low pass filter. So again, what kind of filter do we need? We just answered that, it's a low pass filter. So your reconstruction would be recovering, sorry, that, let me try again there, recovering that by eliminating all these higher frequency replicas. So it's a low pass filter we need. A low pass filter in the frequency domain looks like that, or an ideal low pass filter looks like that. In the time domain, that looks like a sync function. Remember that? A rect function in the frequency domain looks like a sync function in the time domain. So multiplying by that in frequency is like convolving with a sync function in the time domain. So we'd need to carry out a convolution in time. But that's difficult to visualize and difficult to do mathematically. So it's easier to think about multiplying by a low pass filter in the frequency domain. So that's all I wanted to cover today. I wanted to introduce the idea of sampling and the Nyquist theorem to determine at what rate we need to sample. The answer is it's at least twice the maximum bandwidth or the maximum frequency component in the signal. We discussed this idea of an essential bandwidth which we introduced last week and we spoke about the effect of aliasing and we introduced the idea of signal recovery which we also call reconstruction and that's how to recover our original signal, our original continuous time signal from our sampled signal. Next week, we'll stop talking about signals and we'll start talking about systems. And just as a reminder, the week after next, so that means on the 30th of November, there is a test. So put that in your diaries. Okay, the next test is on the 30th of November. So I hope you found that helpful. I will see you in the problem class where we'll go over problem sheet six and some of the Ken pencasts. So until then, stay safe.